What are the qualifications for one-on-one -on -one vibrating? I always say to people, it's three things. Do you love God? Do you love people? Do you love the scriptures? That's it. Whether you're a new Christian, a mature Christian, you're young, you're middle-aged, you're old, it doesn't really matter. It's very simple. It's a simple way to fulfill the Great Commission. The Great Commission doesn't have to be overcomplicated. In fact, there are many seemingly ordinary things Christians can do to encourage the spiritual growth of others. Kevin Halloran recently conversed with Sean Martin, Word Partners Director of Training in Europe, to talk about one simple way to fulfill the Great Commission, one-to-one -one Bible reading. And Sean, I wanted to ask you about this topic because I know your passion for one-to-one -one reading and the value it provides to you as a pastor and to the church in general. Mm. So can you start off by making the case for one-to-one -one Bible reading? Sure. Um, first of all, uh, I want to start on the personal level. My case for one-to-one -one Bible reading goes back 20 years when I became a Christian. And uh, the man who led me to the Lord uh, met with me regularly to read the scriptures with me and pray and to disciple me. And it had an enormous impact on my life. Um, and I'm very grateful to God for that. So one-to-one -one Bible reading was something that captured me on the personal level as a disciple of Christ in my early walk. And I've kept that one-to-ones the, you know, the whole time I've been walking with Jesus for, for 20 years now. Um, to make the case for one-to-one -one Bible reading, I think sometimes it's helpful, you know, in the midst, midst of, you know, being in the trenches of day-to-day -day life and ministry to go to the 10,000 foot level and ask why, why do we read the Bible anyways? Why do we want to meet with people? And so I want to talk about convictions. I think that the, the prime reason why I do Bible reading one-to-one -one with people and why I would encourage people listening to do it is because we believe uh, as evangelical Christians that the word of God is the word of God, that God speaks and what he's spoken has been written. Um, and we believe that the word of God brings life and transformation. When God speaks, things happen. Um, you think about Genesis chapter 1, God spoke the world into creation through his word, and as he spoke, so it was, right? Let there be, and so it was. That's a common refrain in the creation narrative. So we see that creation and life is a direct result of God speaking. For example, you might think of Isaiah chapter 55, verses 10 and 11, where God compares his word to the rain that comes down from heaven. And he says, I'm paraphrasing here, just as the rain goes out and doesn't return empty, but provides seed for the sower and bread for the eater, God says, my word's the same. It goes out and it never returns to empty, but it accomplishes all that he desires. So we have to ask ourselves, do I share that conviction that God is a speaking God, that what he has spoken is written in the scriptures, Old and New Testament, and that does his word still bring life and transformation today? Well, we believe it does. For example, that's why we share the gospel with unbelievers. We believe that as we tell people the gospel message, the gospel message, Paul says in Corinthians, is the power of God to save those who believe Jew and Gentile. So I think it's good to remember that there's a conviction that underlies all Bible ministry, not just one-to-one -one ministry, but any Bible ministry. Do you share that conviction? about the Word of God. Secondly, a conviction about the Great Commission. The, another reason why we do one-to-one -one Bible reading is in Matthew chapter 28, the risen Lord Jesus, who says that he has all authority in heaven and on earth, commands us, all disciples in every age, to make disciples of all the nations by teaching them to obey all that he's commanded and by baptizing them in his name. So one-to-one -one Bible reading is another way to fulfill the Great Commission. Right? How do I make a disciple? Well, I could read the Bible with someone one-to-one, -one, and they and I will be changed and grow as disciples of Jesus as God's Word speaks its life into our hearts and as we pray together. So one-to-one -to -one Bible reading is a simple way to fulfill the Great Commission. And one of the reasons why I like one-to-one -one Bible reading is you don't have to be a professional pastor. You don't have to be a great evangelist. You don't have to be seminary educated. You know, what are the qualifications for one-to-one -one Bible reading? I always say to people, it's three things. Do you love God? Do you love people? Do you love the scriptures? That's it. Whether you're a new Christian, a mature Christian, you're young, you're middle-aged, you're old, it doesn't really matter. It's very simple. It's a simple way to fulfill the Great Commission. Sit down with someone for an hour a week, pray, read the scriptures together, and watch God do his work. And I've seen it happen over and over and over again around the world as I've led to one to ones and been discipled myself. Um, both of you grow. It's terrific. It's amazing. And it is so simple, but it is so powerful. It goes such a long way because you encounter God. Yeah. All you need is his word, another believer, and you're ready to go. Absolutely. One of the challenges I had when I first started reading the Bible one to one was focus. There are a lot of different rabbit trails you can go down. You can try and answer every question someone might have from the text. 
What is your main focus in one-to-one Bible reading? Mm. I think focus is a key word, Kevin, because in some senses, uh, one-to-one Bible reading uh, time is like any meeting. You know, you imagine a, a work meeting, for example. Uh, you know, many people express their frustrations with meetings where we feel like we, we thought we we're going to meet about this. We end up talking about this or that. We go off on tangents and a one-hour meeting turns into three-hour meetings. And I think that if you don't have a focus and a goal... Um, and some organization to your one-to-one, the similar thing can happen. You can end up talking about all manner of things. So as far as a focus with one-to-one, I use what I call the Swedish Bible study method. So when I'm starting to meet with someone one-to-one, I'll say, look, okay, let's say, for example, we're going to work through the book of Genesis, a chapter at a time. I will say, I want you to read Genesis ahead of time. I'll read it as well. And let's answer four questions before we come. So we're prepared. Mm -hmm. First of all, what do you see? So asking good questions and just what what do you see? What do you observe that stands out in the passage? Secondly, what questions do you have of the passage? So if Moses was here today and you could ask him a clarifying question, what will those questions be? And we'll wrestle with those together as we look at the text. Thirdly, what is the heart of the passage? Meaning, what is the big idea? What's the main thing the author is trying to say in this chapter of Scripture we're looking at? And then fourthly, what's the intent or application? What was the application for the original audience and what is it for us today? So by coming prepared with those four questions, those four questions give us the focus and actually drive the meeting so that we know where we're going. We know that those four questions are going to shape our conversation. We're going to move methodically through those questions And so it's actually a very rich time. And by doing that, it helps us to avoid going down rabbit trails and answering every question. Our goal isn't to answer every single question, but our goal is to get the main idea of the text, right? And to apply it to our lives and pray over it. What are some of the books that you read the most with different types of people? I'm thinking believers, unbelievers, new believers. Mm. I think, uh, you know, with an unbeliever, I will typically go to Mark's Gospel Um, it's a great way to meet Jesus as he walks off the pages of scripture. It's short, it's punchy, it's very clear. Um, it's narrative. So it's action, acts and action. There's a lot of things going on. And, um, unlike John's gospel, for example, there aren't as many theological abstractions that you have to work people through like the I am statements and stuff, which take a lot of explanation. I find Mark is a little more straightforward. Um, and it really just gets to the heart very quickly of who Jesus is, what he came to do and what it means to, to walk with him on the path of the cross so Mark, I feel, is, is probably the best book for an unbeliever, in my opinion. With new believers, Colossians is my go-to book. And the reason for that is I think of Colossians as a mini Romans. It's a, it's a gateway to the gospel. It really explains the gospel well. So, of course, in the first chapter, you have Paul reminding and outlining the Colossians of what the gospel is, the fruit of bears of faith and hope and love. Um, in the latter half of the chapter, he makes it very clear who Jesus is. Um, and and who this Jesus is and what he did on the cross, you know, the supremacy of him as Lord and the sufficiency of his sacrifice. And in the following chapters, you really have, like Romans, Paul working out the implications of the gospel. What does it mean for the new life we're called to live and put in the old life behind? What does it look like in married life? What does it look like at the workplace? I find Colossians is a very foundational book. And again, it's quite straightforward. It's a great book for new believers. It's foundational. With more mature believers, I just work back and forth between Old and New Testament. So I'll ask, you know, what, 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 what's a book maybe you've never read before that we should read together so we can really work through? So some years ago, a guy I was meeting one-to-one with said, you know, I've never really read through Isaiah. And so we spent a whole summer working our way through Isaiah. And we, we kind of did an overview. We didn't work, you know, verse by verse through all 66 chapters. But um, we did spend quite a bit of time working our way through and had a terrific time. How do you typically prepare for a one-to-one Bible reading session? It's probably a little different for you than the average person since you've done it for so long. You know these books pretty well by now. I will say this. If, if you're a, a pastor or, or someone in full-time ministry listen to this, I will say this, that one thing I've learned is that it's very important to not over-prepare um, for one-to-one. And I certainly did that in my early days. And the reason I say that is, is if you're a pastor or you're a full-time ministry worker and someone comes to meet with you, Whether you're aware of it or not, the automatic dynamic of the meeting is they're going to look to you for the answers, right? Sean, you're a pastor. You know the stuff. You just tell me. Just preach to me. Just preach a sermon. Exactly, exactly. And when I was young, that was a great temptation to do because, you know, we're very excited about the scriptures. 
So one thing I do to, in preparation is I will tell the person I'm meeting with because I'm a full-time ministry worker is this is a two-way street. So we're going to learn from one another. I'm going to learn from you as much as you're going to learn from me. Um, and I want to make it clear, I'm not going to teach you what Colossians says, you know, next week. We're going to discover it together. So I make that clear in the conversation with that person so they know what's, what's going to happen. Secondly, as I mentioned earlier with the Swedish method, I give those person those four questions to work through. And I do the same thing. So I actually over the years have, I wouldn't say under prepare, but I just do the basics. So I don't look at commentaries. I don't pull out my old sermons. I just look at Colossians fresh, pray over it, ask those four questions. And I just come with a piece of paper and say, okay, here's the things I, th I thought of when I thought of those four questions. What did you think of? So that the learning becomes very mutual. That's very, very important to do because the tendency of a lot of people one to ones is to really want to study up on it, right? And come and show you all I've got. And the purpose of a one-to-one -one isn't to show you all I've got. It's to discover together. And if you are a full-time ministry worker and you learn to not come super prepared, I think it also helps you to develop the posture of a learner, that I can learn things from brand new Christians. I've met with new Christians asking me questions I've never thought of. And I thought, wow, that's actually a really good question. I'm glad they asked that. And it makes me think and work. And so... You, the learning really is always both ways. You can always learn things from God's people. So uh, we want the learning to be mutual. So that preparation, not over-preparing, is very, very important. I want to say one other thing about preparing and the actual one-to-one -one as well. And that is that uh, a pitfall to avoid is so easily as we grow in our relationship in a one-to-one, -one, a friendship hopefully uh, comes out of it. And the tendency is you want to chat and catch up all the time. And so uh, I encourage people to be very disciplined. So if I'm meeting someone for an hour, five minutes is catch up time. Unless a tragedy has happened in their life and it turns into a prayer and shepherding moment. I will typically spend five minutes. Hey, what, what's happening in your life? What do you think of the Cubs game or how's work going? Whatever it is that's going on or how was your holiday? A quick catch up. Let's read the text, pray, spend about 45 minutes working through the passage together. A couple minutes sharing prayer requests. How can we pray the scripture passage we read into our lives? How can we pray for our church? How can we pray for the world? One hour, we're done. Another pitfall to avoid as well is I always encourage men to meet with men and women to meet with women. Um, whether you're single or married, when you meet one-to-one, -one, you're going to share your lives over time. You're going to start being open and vulnerable to one another about how God's stretching you or struggles that you're having. And just the relational dynamics between men and women, it can just lead you into, you know, into areas that could be dangerous. So I always encourage men to meet with women, men and women to meet with women. I think there are people who agree with you that one-to-one -one Bible reading is is a great ministry idea. But maybe there are even some people listening who think, wow, that's awesome. I just don't have time with all the other pressures of life or of ministry. Yeah. What might you say to that person? And, and maybe they would even say, you know, it's not an efficient use of my time because I'm only meeting with one person. Mm. Whereas when I yeah. preach a sermon, I preach to the whole congregation. Mm. What would you say to that pastor? Yeah, I think I'd say a few things. I think first of all is may God keep us from ever being in a place where we think I'm too busy to make disciples. <laughs> Uh, if we're in the ministry, all Christians are called to make disciples. That's the command of the risen Lord Jesus. He commands all of us to make disciples. So it's not an option. It's actually a command from Jesus to make disciples. And one-to-ones are great because it's a simple way to make disciples. Again, you can meet someone for an hour a week, meet him in the morning. I used to have a guy who was a very, very busy banker. So we met at six o'clock in the morning, every Friday morning. And it was hard for him to get up that early. It was hard for me to get up that early, but that was the only time we could carve out in the week. And so we just made the discipline of doing it. Now I remember many times feeling sorry for myself when the alarm went off at 5.30 to go for the one-to-one. -one. And I remember many times driving and thinking, this is really early. I don't know why I do this so early. I'm done. But every time once we got going, we always at the end said that was worth it. It's always worth it to do it. We're never too busy to make disciples. I think a question you've got to ask yourself in ministry if you feel you're too busy is, is are you letting the urgent overtake the important? And we can feel that emails are important, are urgent or, you know, texts are urgent or meetings that we have are urgent. And yes, we need to attend to those things. But what we're primarily here to do is to make disciples. And that's important. So I want to make sure that the important overtakes the urgent in my schedule. So you've just got to work it into your week. And it's like going to the gym. You might feel you're too busy at first. But once you get going into the gym, you'll make time to go because you're enjoying it. And you're seeing the results. And a one-to-one's the same thing. It's like going to the gym. You just got to get yourself going. But once you go and build momentum, you'll find you'll, that you want to make time for it. As far as um, 
how strategic is it? You know, you were mentioning earlier, you know, just meeting with one person. Well, you're not just meeting with one person because in ministry, we should have a training mindset. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, we know the, the passage, well, I hope the apostle Paul says to Timothy, what you've heard from me and the presence of faithful witnesses pass on to faithful men who are able to teach others also. And so in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, you have four generations. You have the Apostle Paul, you have Timothy as protege, you have the faithful men, and then the others. So when I start meeting with one-to-one with somebody, I lay out that vision with them from the get-go, that this one-to-one doesn't stop with you. So I'm going to start meeting with you one-to-one, and we'll do this for about two or three months. And at that point, we're going to have a conversation together, and I'm going to encourage you to find two people to meet with and read the Bible one-to-one with. And what happens is by the third month or so, people are really seeing the benefit of it. They're enjoying it. They're seeing the change. And then ask, let's start praying and thinking through one or two people that you could consider starting a one-to-one with. Well, if that one person starts meeting with two, and then I tell them, and you do the same thing with those two you meet, you after some months tell those two to meet with one or two. Before you know it, that one-to-one that you started has an exponential growth. Two people meeting like that, having that vision of multiplying the one-to-one, you could start a Bible reading movement in your church. You could start a Bible reading movement in your high school if you're a high schooler doing this. You can start a Bible reading movement in your community and so on. So uh, it's never a waste just to meet with one person, but if you bring the training mindset as well, you can have people reading the Bible all over. Really engaging the scriptures is the the way we're transformed by the scriptures. You can't shortcut that. One thing I've heard you mention, Sean, is that sometimes you will FaceTime or Skype with some of the guys overseas that we train as a ministry. If schedules or proximity is a challenge, technology these days can make it very easy. Um, Absolutely, it does. You know, sometimes it can't be face to face. So um, there's a young man in ministry in a certain Eastern European country that wants to talk through theological things that might be an issue in his denomination. And so he's asked to FaceTime with me regularly to talk through those theological issues. So we'll read through the scriptures. He'll ask me questions and I'll talk him through things and we'll pray together. And that's been a great encouragement to him. And so, yeah, the you know the FaceTime platform allows us to do that. There's also a young man who's just moved to Brazil recently going through some tough times in life and ministry. And again, I just had a chat with him the other day over a Facebook Messenger video, and we had a great conversation. Now it's not quite the same as face-to-face. We're physical beings, and we know that, you know, you can't be, you know, personal interaction face-to-face physical. But still, if FaceTime and, and Messenger video is what you have, um, it's still an effective way to encourage and shepherd people right around the world. And it's terrific. I wouldn't be able to do that. Letters take a long time. <laughs> Well, thanks for the encouragement, Sean. Mm. And I know you wanted to recommend a resource on one-to-one yeah. Bible reading. Yep. I recommend anyone who's thinking about one-to-one Bible reading or wants to have a little bit of training in one-to-one Bible reading to, to read one-to-one Bible reading by David Helm. It's an absolutely superb book. I think it's the best book I've seen on one-to-one Bible reading, and I recommend it to everyone. It's, what is it, like 70 or 80 pages and has yeah. questions in the back that it you can work through. questions in the back and ideas, uh, you know, what to do and what not to do, what a wonder Bible reading is and what it is not. And um, and it's terrific. You know, it's, it's, it's a straightforward read. You read that, it'll really encourage you and give you some guidelines and how to do it. So highly recommend that book. This audio recording is a production of Word Partners a ministry dedicated to elevating God's life-giving word in the hearts, lives, and ministries of pastors and their people. Learn more about our ministry at wordpartners.org.